Welcome back to Los Angeles. The Cube is live. It feels so good to say that. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> the Cube is live in Los Angeles. We are at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con 21, Lisa Martin with Dave Nicholson. We're talking to Stormforge next. Cool name, right? We're going to get to the bottom of that. Please welcome Matt Provo, the founder and CEO of Stormforge, and Tom Ellery, the SVP of Revenue. Stormforge, guys, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So Matt, Stormforge, you have to stay it like that. Like I feel like, do you guys wear Stormtrooper outfits on Halloween? <laughs> Sometimes Stormtrooper, the colors are black. You know, we hit anvils from time to time. I'm I thought I, I thought no. they, that there I saw may or may not be anvil. a heavy metal band that <laughs> might be infringing on our name. It's all good. I see. That's where so, we come from. You, so you started the company in 2015. Talk to me about the genesis of the company. What were some of the gaps in the market that you saw that said we got to come in here and solve this? Yeah, so I was fortunate to always know, I think when you start a company, sometimes you, uh, you know exactly the set of problems that you want to go after and potentially why you might be uniquely you know, set up to solve it. Um, what we knew at the beginning was we had a, a number of really talented data scientists. I was frustrated by uh, the buzzwords around AI, machine learning, when under the hood there's really a lot of vaporware. And so at the outset, really, uh, the, the point was build something real at the core, um, connect that to a, a set of problems that could drive value. And when we looked at um, really the beginnings of Kubernetes and containerization five, six years ago at its genesis, um, we saw just a bunch of opportunity for uh, machine learning to play uh, the right kind of role if we could build it uh, correctly. And so, uh, at the outset, it was, uh, what's going on? Why are people people moving uh, workloads over to containers in the first place? And you know, because of the flexibility and the portability around uh, Kubernetes, we then ran into quickly its complexity. And uh, within that complexity was really the foundation to set up uh, the company and the solution for uh, prob a set of problems uniquely and most beneficially solved by using machine learning. And so when we sort of brought that together and um, designed out some ideas, we, uh, we did what any, uh, any founder with a product background would do. We went and talked to a bunch of potential users and kind of tried to validate the problems themselves and, and got a really positive response, so. So, Tom, from a business perspective, what, what attracted you to this? Well, initially I wasn't attracted, just I'll say that. <laughs> just from a startup standpoint. So I've been in the industry for 30 years. I've done six or seven pre-IPO companies. I was exiting a private company. I did not want to go do another startup company. But being in the largest enterprise companies for the last 20 years, you see Kubernetes like wildfire in these places. And you knew there was a huge amount of complexity and sophistication when they deployed it. So I started talking to Matt early on. He explained what they were doing and how unique the offering was around machine learning. I already knew the problems that customers had at scale with uh, Kubernetes. So it was for me, I said, all right, I'm going to take one more run at this with Matt. I think we're, we're in a great position to differentiate ourselves. So that was really the, the launch pad for me, was really the technology and the market space. Those two, those two things in combination are very exciting for, for us as a business And entity. you know, a couple bottles of amazing wine and a, and a few, <laughs> That's a, always a helps number helps. of dinners. Yeah, that, that does that always help. As well. Behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that definitely helps. That twisted Tom's yeah. arm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Matt, tell us, just really kind of get into the technology. What does it do? How does it help facilitate the Kubernetes environment yeah, for our customers? Ab absolutely. So uh, when uh, organizations start moving workloads uh, over to Kubernetes and get their applications up and running, um, there's a number of amazing organizations, whether it's through cloud providers or otherwise, that, that sort of solve that day one problem and those challenges. And as I was mentioning, you know, they move because of flexibility, and so developers love it, and it starts to create a great experience, but there's these set of expectations. And, and let me just, yeah. where, where, where typically are these moving from? Yeah. What, are, you know, what, what, are the, what are the top three environments these are, these are moving out of? Yeah, I mean, of course, non-containerized environments, right. uh, more generally. <laughs> uh, they could be uh, coming from uh, you know, bare metal, uh, environment that could be coming from kind of a VM driven environment. Okay. Um, so when you look back at kind of the, the growth and genesis and uh, uh, of VMs, you see a lot of parallels to what we're seeing okay. now with uh, with containerization. And so as you move, it's um, it's exciting. Uh, and then you get smacked in the face with the complexity. Uh, 
for all of the knobs that are able to be turned within a Kubernetes environment. Uh, it gives developers a lot of flexibility. Uh, these knobs, as you turn them, you, you have no visibility into, into the impact on the application itself. And so uh, often organizations are um, become, you know, becoming more agile, shipping, uh, you know, shipping code more quickly, uh, but then all of a sudden the, the cloud bill comes and they've over-provisioned by 80, 90%. The, they didn't need nearly as many resources. And so uh, what we do is we help understand the unique uh, goals and requirements for each of the applications that are running in Kubernetes. And uh, we have uh, machine learning capabilities that can predict very accurately what organizations will need from a resource standpoint in order to meet their goals, not just from a cost standpoint, but also from a performance standpoint. And so uh, we allow organizations to typically save usually between 40 and 60% uh, off their cloud bill and usually increase performance between 30 and 50%. Um, historically, developers had to choose between cost and performance and their worldview on, on the application environment was very limited to a small set of what we would call parameters or metrics that they could choose from. And machine learning allows that world to just be blown open. And, um, not many humans are, uh, are sophisticated in the way we think about multi-dimensional math to be able to make those kinds of predictions. You're talking about billions and billions of combinations, not just in a static environment, but on an ongoing basis. And so our technology uh, sits in the middle of all that chaos and, uh, and allows, it to, uh, allows organizations just to re reap a whole lot of benefits that they otherwise may not ever fund. Those numbers that you mentioned were, were big from a cost savings perspective yeah. and a performance increase perspective, which is so critical these yeah. days as in the last 18 months we've seen so much change. We've seen massive pivots from companies in every industry yeah. to survive, yeah. first of all, and yeah. then to be able to thrive and, and be able to iterate quickly enough to develop new products and services and get them to market to be competitive. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I, the, yeah. It, sorry, sorry. I mean, the, the thing that's interesting, there was an article by Dreesen Horowitz, I don't know if you've taken another cloud paradox. Yes. And you, you, so we actually, if you start looking at that, great example would be some of these cloud companies that are growing like astronomical rates. Snowflake's like phenomenal what they're doing. But go look at their COGS and what it's doing also. It's growing almost proportionally as the revenue's growing. So you need to be able to solve that problem in a way that is sophisticated enough with machine learning algorithms that people don't have to be in the loop to do it and that the math can prove out the solution as you go out and scale your environments. And a lot of companies now are all transitioning over to SaaS-based platforms and they're going to start running into these problems that they go, as they go to scale. And those are the areas that we're really focused and concentrating on as an organization. As the leader of sales, talk to me about the voice of the customer. What are so, you've been there six months or so. Yes. We heard we heard about the wine and the dinners. It's <laughs> obvious. We sway. haven't done a lot of that uh, over the last eighteen months. You have to make up months. for lost time. As <laughs> so he closes more business. Oh, oh more there dinner. we go. We got that <laughs> on camera. You know how that you know how that <laughs> Sorry, works. Sorry, Tom. Right. We got that on camera. But talk to me about there's, the voice of the customer. There's there's been three uh, market spaces that we've had some really good success in. So I talked about a SaaS marketplace. So there's a, a company that uh, does Drupal. That, and Matt knows very well up in Boston, Acquia, and they have every customer is a unique Snowflake customer. So they need to optimize each of their customers in order to ensure the cost as well as performance for that customer on their site works appropriately. So that's one example of a SaaS-based company that where we can go in and help them optimize without humans doing the optimization and the math and the machine learning from Stormforge doing that. So that's an area. The other area that we've seen some uh, really good traction candidly is with GSIs. So part of our go-to-market model is with GSIs. So if you think about what a GSI does, a lot of times customers are struggling either initially deploying Kubernetes or putting it in for 12, 18 months and realizing we're starting to scale, we got all kinds of performance issues, how do I solve that? A lot of these people go to the Accentures, the Cognizance, and other ones, and start flying their ninjas in to kind of solve the problem. So we're getting a lot of traction with them because they're using our tool as a way to help solve the customer's problems, and they're in the largest enterprise customers as possible. So, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, you're saying that when I deploy serverless applications, I may in fact get a bill for servers that are being used. <laughs> is, that, is, that what you're, is that what you're telling us? There, there in fact may be a bill <laughs> for what was coined as serverless. 
uh, that is very difficult to understand, by the way. And, That's crazy and, talk, man. And connect back, yeah. <laughs> but a absolutely, uh, we deal with that all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a painful process from time to time. But have you have you seen the statistics that's going on with how people, I mean, there was huge inertia from every CIO that you had to have a cloud strategy in place. Everyone sure. ran out and had a cloud strategy in place. And then they started deploying on Kubernetes. Now they're realizing, oh, wow, we can run it, but it's costing us more than it ever costs us on-prem and the operational complexities associated with that. So there's not enough people in the industry to help solve that problem, especially at the grassroots. That's where you need sophisticated solutions like Stormforge and machine learning to help solve this at scale problem in a way that humans could never solve. And I would, I would just add to that that the, the same humans managing uh, the Kubernetes application environments today were le are likely the same humans that were managing it in a, in a VM world. So there's a huge skills gap. Uh, I love what Kasten announced uh, at KubeCon this year around their learning environment where it's free, come learn Kubernetes in this, and we need more of that. There's an enormous skills gap. And, uh, and the, the, the problems are complex enough in and of themselves, but when, we have, when you add that to the skills gap, um, it, it's, it presents a lot of challenges for organizations. What are some of the ways in which you think that gap can start to be made smaller? Yeah, I mean, I think as more workloads get moved over, over, you know, over time, you see, uh, uh, you see more and more people becoming uh, comfortable in an environment where scale is a part of uh, what they have to manage and take care of. I love what the um, Linux Foundation and the CNCF are doing around Kubernetes certifications. You know, more and more training. I think you're going to see uh, training, you know, uh, availability for more and more uh, developers and practitioners uh, be adopted more widely. You know, and I think that. Um, you know, as the the tool chain itself hardens within a CI/CD uh, world, in a con containerized world, as that hardens, you're gonna you're gonna start seeing more and more uh, individuals who are comfortable across all these different tools. If you look at the CNCF landscape, I mean, it, and today compared to four or five years ago, it's growing like crazy. And so, um, but but there's also consolidation taking place within the tools and people have an opportunity to, to learn and, and gain expertise uh, within those, which is very marketable, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my employees often uh, show me their LinkedIn profiles. They remind you of that. And uh, <laughs> remind really? me of how, how much they're getting recruited. Uh, but they've been loyal, so it's been fantastic. There are so many parallels when you look at uh, VM and virtualization and what's happening with Kubernetes, obviously all the abstractions and stuff, but there was this whole concept of VM sprawl, you know, maybe 10 years in. If you think about the Kubernetes environment, that is an exponentially bigger problem because of how many they're spinning up versus how, how many you spun up in VM. So those things ultimately need to be solved. It's not just going to be solved with people, it needs to be solved with sophisticated software. That's the only way you're going to solve a problem at scale like that. No matter how many people you have in the industry, it's just never going to solve the problem. So when you're in customer conversations, Tom, what do you say are like the top three differentiators that really set Stormforge apart? Well, so the first one is we're very focused on Kubernetes only. So that's all we do is just Kubernetes environment. So we understand not just the applications that run in Kubernetes, but we understand the underlying architectures and techniques, which we think is really important from a uh, solution standpoint. So you're specialist? We are absolutely specialists. Okay. The other area is obviously our machine learning and the sophistication of our machine learning. And Matt said this really well early on. I mean, the buzzwords are all out there. You can read them all, all over the place for the last five to seven years, AI and ML, and a lot of them are very hollow. But our whole foundation was based on machine learning and PhDs from Harvard. That's where we came out of from a technology background. So we were solving more, we weren't just solving the Kubernetes problems, we were solving machine learning problems. And so that's another really big area of differential for us. Uh, and I think the ability to actually scale and not just deal with small problems, but very large problems, because our focus is the Fortune 2000 companies, and most of them have been deploying like financial services and stuff, Kubernetes, for three, four, five years. And so they have at scale challenges that they're trying to solve. Yeah, it's, uh, Lisa and I talk about this concept of machine learning and uh, looking under the covers and trying to find out, is the machine really learning? Yeah. <laughs> is it really learning? Or is it people are telling the machine, 
you need to do this yeah. if you see that. Yeah. Or is the machine actually making those correlations yeah. and doing something intelligently? Yeah. So can you give us an example of something that is actually happening that's intelligent? Well, so the, the if this then that problem is actually a huge source of my original frustration for starting the company because you, you, you tag AI as a buzzword onto a lot of stuff and we see that growing you know like crazy and so I literally at the beginning said if we can't actually build something real that solves problems like we're, we're gonna hang it up and you know as Tom said we, we came out of Harvard and you know there was a challenge initially of are we just gonna build like a really amazing algorithm that's so heavy it can never be productized or commercialized and it really should have just stayed in academia and um, you know, I, I, I will say a couple things. Uh, one is, I do not believe that um, uh, that black box AI is, is a thing. Uh, we believe in what we would call human augmented AI. So we want to empower practitioners and developers into the process instead of automate them out. We just want to give them the, the information and we want to save time for them and make their lives easier. But there's a kill switch on the technology. They can intervene at any point in time. They can direct the technology as they see fit. And what's really, really interesting is because their worldview of this application environment gets opened up by all the predictions and all of the learning that actually is taking place, uh, and uh, you know, give it, because that worldview is open, they then get into a kind of a tinkering or experimental mindset with the technology. And they start thinking about all these other scenarios that they never were able to explore previously with the application. And, uh, and so the machine learning itself is um, on an ongoing basis, understanding changes in traffic, understanding and changes, changes in workloads for the application or demand. If you thought about uh, like surge pricing for Uber, you know, because of uh, a big game that took place, and you know, that that change in peaks and valleys in demand, uh, our, our technology under, not only understands those reactively, but it starts to build models and predict proactively in advance of the events that are going to take place uh, on on what need what kind of resources need to be allocated and why. That's the other piece around it. Is often uh, solutions are giving you a little bit of the what, but they certainly are not giving you any explanation of, of the why. So the holy grail really, like in our world, is kind of truly explainable AI, which we're not there yet. Nobody's there yet. Uh, but human augmented AI with, with actual intelligence that's taking place that also is relevant to, to business outcomes is, is pretty exciting. So that's why we try to operate. Very exciting. Guys, thanks for joining us, talking to us about Stormforge. I feel like we need some Stormforge t-shirts. What do you think? I think we can make that happen. Yeah. 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 Oh, I think right. we can. See, I'm not even asking for the bottle of wine. I just, <laughs> yeah, just, I know. Just, just a t-shirt. We'll wrap yeah, it exactly. in a bottle of wine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that idea. <laughs> That's a good Guys, thank, Matt and Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Exciting company. Congratulations on your success, and we thanks look so forward much. to seeing what great things are to come from Stormforge. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Our pleasure. For Dave Nicholson, I'm Lisa Martin. We are live in Los Angeles, the Cube, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 21. Stick around, Dave and I will be right back with our next guest.